Sorry, those 10 minutes just fly by. Now, uh, because of our time constraints, we're going to miss page nine, which I feel very sad about, but I do hope you'll read about Jesus healing the blind man. It's a lovely, lovely story about blind Bartimaeus who um, was standing by the roadside and he recognized who Jesus was, uh, not by his eyesight, but because he knew the Old Testament. It was quite amazing. And he called Jesus the son of God, or the son, no, son of David, sorry. And he called him Jesus, the son of David. And this blind man had a lot of knowledge about who Jesus was. And the, the, the others with Jesus were telling the blind man, oh, you, you be quiet, don't, don't bother Jesus. He's busy, he's got an itinerary and agenda and he's, you know, he's on his way. And Jesus stopped and he said, no, I want to help this man. And so Jesus gave this blind man sight and it was lovely. And then once the blind man could see, the story ends with the blind man saying, now I'm going to follow Jesus. He followed Jesus along the road. And of course I would follow him too. He'd given me sight. And uh, so he began his life's journey of following Jesus. So we're going to then jump to page 10 and uh, we're going to read an, an amazing uh, event now, a, a great event, uh, Jesus Raising the Dead. So I think uh, Martin will help us get uh, Luke chapter 7 and verse 17. Oh, there it is already. Before you ask, it shall be given. So thank you, Martin, very much. Let's read this uh, story together. Well, it's not just a story, you know, this is a real event. So Jesus raises the widow's son. So we're reading about a lady who is a widow. She's already lost her husband. And now very sadly, her son has died as well. And so she's a very sad woman. And uh, actually it's the day of the, her son's funeral. And he's just died in, in Israel. They bury the people very quickly. And so she is just taking her son in the coffin with some friends to the cemetery. And uh, so we're just meeting them as they're on their way. So let's read together. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up. And touch the bear, is it? Beer. beer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then he went up and touched the beer. They were carrying him on. Sorry, I guess he was on more of a stretcher, not in a coffin. I think you see that the, the um, translation's a bit different in this version. And the bear stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us. They said, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Okay, so amazing uh, story, just incredible. Uh, so this uh, poor widow 
uh, who probably was actually poor as well, uh, but she was very sad and uh, she uh, maybe was looking to a future where she would have to beg for food on the street. Her life seemed to be coming to an end. She'd already lost her husband and now her son was gone. And so it was a very, very moving and very sad day for her. Now, Jesus was going through the city, the town, and I'm sure he, he had a destination in mind. And I don't think this was exactly his destination, but maybe, maybe he knew what was going on. But anyway, you know, he didn't really have to stop, but he did. And that's what I noticed about Jesus. You see, Jesus is filled with compassion. And he recognizes the people's need, whatever the need might be. And in this case, he saw the woman's sadness because her son had died. And so Jesus did what was natural to him. He wanted to help this woman. And how could he best help her? Well, he could bring back her son, but he was already dead. Well, Jesus could raise him from the dead. And wasn't that amazing? Jesus could raise the dead. All right. He had power and authority over death. Absolutely amazing. Well, Jesus will tell us much more about this power that he has because he's going to use this power for himself. And uh, when we come to the end of the life of Jesus, uh, well, so to speak, because he's actually alive today, but on this earth, he did die and then he rose from the dead. And so I just want to read a verse of what Jesus says about himself and about his death. And it's in John 11 and verse 25. And I think we can find that on page 10. And you could read it with me. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And this is a promise that is for all of you who have believed. Jesus is saying, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Well, we may die physically, but Jesus is promising here that we too, just like he, will be resurrected. We will rise again. And one day Jesus will return and all those who belong to Jesus will come out of their graves and we will be taken up into heaven and go to be with the Lord forever. And that is what God or Jesus here is promising. And then the next verse in John 14, 19, he says, because I live, you also will live. Because I live, you also will live. And that's a promise for you and for me. Now, I'm just, well, I don't know if I have time really. I want to just tell you quickly a, a very quick story uh, because this hasn't just happened in the time when Jesus was on, here on earth. I read the most amazing miracle of, that happened a couple of years ago in Pakistan. Now in Pakistan, the people are Muslim. They don't believe in uh, Jesus being God. Uh, and there was a young uh, Pakistani boy, his name was Nasser. And Nasser uh, was very sick. He had bowel cancer. This is a very serious kind of cancer. And the doctors had admitted him to hospital and he had to have surgery right away. And uh, the surgery was not successful. And five days later, Nasser was dead. His family was called and they came to the room and they were just sitting in the hospital room with the body of Nasser lying on the bed the nurses had already come in and prepared his body for burial and um, the family were just weeping and they were they were so brokenhearted. and in that hospital there were two orderlies these are people that 
assist in the hospital. They do different chores and so on. And they were Christian. They believed in Jesus. And when one of the uh, orderlies heard that Nasser had died, he ran and found the other orderly and said, you've got to come. We need to pray for Nasser. He's died. Oh, the other orderly said, I'm not sure about praying for a dead person. No, no, you must come. And so they went to the room where Nasser lay on the bed there. Uh, he'd stopped breathing 25 minutes earlier. And so the orderly, rather reluctantly, a, a little bit awkwardly, went to the bed. He sat on the edge of the bed and he took the, the limp hand of Nasser into his own hand and he began to pray. And as he prayed, he felt the power of God. And so he prayed very passionately, very uh, seriously for Nasser to come alive again. And he prayed in the name of Jesus that Jesus would do it. And just as happened in the story with this widow, Nasser sat up in bed, in the bed, and began to speak. And he was alive. The people couldn't believe it. But it's true. This is a true story. Jesus still does miracles today. Nasser was checked by the doctors and that night at 11 o'clock, he was sent home. They said that he was absolutely perfectly well. There was nothing wrong with him at all. The next day, when the orderlies came to do their work at the hospital, they were interviewed by the doctors because the doctors didn't believe in Jesus being God. And they didn't like what had happened, really. They felt kind of insulted because they hadn't been able to make Nasser well. And here these boys were saying that Jesus had done it. And the poor boys were fired from their job uh, for, for bringing life back to, to a person who was dead. But that's the way things are. And so I guess Nasser had to decide and his family, who is this Jesus? Is he truly the son of God? And they have that question to answer just as we do. Okay, let's turn to page 11 and we have another amazing miracle. Uh, two, actually this one, we get a double miracle. And so let's, um, let's uh, read this one. It's in Luke chapter five and verse 17. I'm so appreciative to Martin. You know, when we do Bibles reading in the classroom with our Bibles, it always takes a long time to find the place. This way, Martin gives it to us right away. So here you can see the title, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. Two miracles. All right, let's begin at verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching. One day Jesus was teaching. And Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And Pharisees and teachers of the law. Were sitting there. Were sitting there. I'm just going to take a little moment to explain who these Pharisees were. The Pharisees were actually, they were religious teachers. They were in the synagogues where Jesus was, and they were teaching the people about God. And they, actually, they weren't very happy about Jesus because, well, you're going to see in this, in this reading that Jesus was claiming to be God, and they didn't believe that. And so they were very, very angry about it and very, very disturbed. And they had a, a word for this. It meant it was blasphemy. It meant that somebody was claiming to be God when in their mind, they weren't God. Of course, Jesus was God, so it wasn't blasphemy. But that's what their situation was. And they were sitting there and they were kind of watching what was going on. And oh, by the way, yes, this is, this is a wonderful story because this poor paralyzed man had four very, very good friends. And these four friends wanted Jesus to heal this man from his paralysis. And so they put their friend on a kind of stretcher and they brought him to the house where Jesus was teaching. Uh, but, you know, the house was packed with people. There was no way any more people could get in there. And uh, so they started to think creatively. And, you know, they came up with an idea of how they could get this poor paralyzed man 
to Jesus. And I think you'll be quite uh, interested in what they did. Okay, I think we better start again. One day, Jesus was teaching. And Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow? Who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins? But God alone. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk but I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins so he said to the paralyzed man I tell you get up take your mat and go home immediately he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Okay, well, that uh, paralyzed man must have been so grateful to his friends. Wow, we all need friends like that. Well, Jesus immediately saw the most desperate need of this man. And right at the very beginning, Jesus uh, forgave his sin. Amazing. Right away, Jesus forgave his sin. And of course, that caused a huge uproar. But let me, I just remember, we have a picture of this and I want um, uh, Martin just to show you the picture. <laughs> I hope you can see it, it's a bit dark, but I, I just thought it was such, a, a, such an incredibly funny picture really, but it's true. And here they are lowering their friend down through the hole in the, in the roof that they have made and right in front of Jesus. <laughs> There was no way that Jesus could avoid this sick man. And uh, I think it's really delightful. So there you are, you've got a picture for this story. Um, but let's go back because Jesus saw the most desperate need of all was the man's sin. And so Jesus right away forgave his sin. Now the Pharisees didn't like this. And they, they were thinking in their minds which of course Jesus could read their minds. That wasn't a problem for him. And they were very, very disturbed that Jesus should be saying that he could forgive sins because they knew that only God could forgive sins. But of course, Jesus is God. So we need to write down, Jesus has power and authority over sin. And the, we'll put the paralysis with the disease section. 
Uh, so that to me is very, very important. This, I guess, really is the most important miracle that Jesus does for us. And of course, that's why Jesus came. He came to be our scapegoat, to pay the, for the sins that we had committed by his death so that we could become righteous. He is our redeemer. He's the one that has paid the price for our sin. And so we need to think, what are we doing? Are we still carrying our sin? Or have we come to Jesus and given our sin to him? That is what Jesus wants to do for us. He wants to remove that sin. I am just going to take the liberty to tell you one other very brief story. And then we have a very wonderful uh, sharing from our friend David. But just, I just, uh, we have a tent, I think, um, Martin. There's a picture of a tent. Very good. All right. There have been a group of uh, university students that have been going to Syria, or not actually to Syria, but to where the refugees uh, of Syria are, maybe in Jordan, and uh, where many of them are living in these kinds of tents. Uh, these are Muslim people that have been thrown out of Syria and they have nowhere to go except to these refugee camps. And these uh, young people from the States are wanting to tell them about Jesus. Well, one day this, one of the students, his name was Daniel, um, was uh, just walking around uh, through the tents and he came to one tent and he kind of knocked at the door and then opened it and said, hello, my name is Daniel. And the eight people that were sitting inside, eight, a, family, a member family, just sort of looked shocked. They almost uh, fainted and uh, some began to sort of shout. And Daniel said, what, what, what's going on here? And his interpreter said, oh, they are saying that last night a man came to the tent. He was dressed all in white and he glowed. And he said, my name is Jesus. And tomorrow Daniel is going to come and visit you and he's going to tell you about me. And well, Daniel was absolutely floored. He couldn't, couldn't believe this had happened. But so right away, he began to tell this family about Jesus. And they were so interested and they were so happy to hear about Jesus. Their hearts were prepared and they accepted Jesus that day. The whole family, they all believed. And those, that family have become underground workers for God. And they are starting churches amongst the refugees. And they're telling people about Jesus. It's just a wonderful, wonderful story. And I just wanted you to know, because um, Jesus does this. I, uh, many years ago, I was helping um, Iranian people, from, people from Iran, to learn English and I was also teaching, using the Bible to teach them. And one of the girls had a vision of Jesus uh, in her, at home and then she told me about it. And the next day she believed. God can do anything to help us to believe. But he may not be so dramatic with us, but just be ready, listen to his words and accept them, they are true. Now, I'm just so happy to uh, introduce to you David, uh, who's presently working in Vancouver, and uh, he has an amazing story to tell you. This is a story of God's grace. So I'll just pass it over to David now. Thanks, David. Hey, uh, uh也是很典型出生在一个很典型的普通的一个中国家庭
，嗯，比较相信科学啊，就说，呃，像我们那时代的人啊，就比较相信，呃，个人的奋斗啊，就相信自己的，呃，就是个人的理想啊等等的是，能够靠着自己的这个个人的努力奋斗来实现啊，就是，而且，呃，也比较相信道德的力量。啊，觉得嗯，呃，整个来说，自我会觉得自己的道德水平啊还是比较好的，就是自己还是嗯、呃、比较啊、呃，在这社会上还是有道属于有道德的人。嗯，我在呃，对于呃这个神灵的这个态度嘛，就是说过去一直都是也是。呃，受我们传统的这个中国的这种影响，就说，呃，我是觉得可能是当时是当时是觉得是啊，有有神灵的，呃，但是我不认为，呃，我就呃能够能够了解的，我不会花时间去了解的，我没有时间，我要生活啊、呃，我没有时间去了解这些神灵的事情。我采取的态度基本上就是我们的，呃，啊、呃，就是孔子啊、呃、所说的，在他的《论语》里所说的，就是敬鬼神而远之。啊、呃，那就是说我相信有神灵，但是我我不会去，呃，去接触它，去去研究它。我们自己有自己的人生要过。嗯，这就就这样，我就是认为，啊、呃，我们。靠着我自己的力量，我就啊，扎扎实实的啊，一步一步的走下去，来实现我自己的这些人生的梦想。我相信，呃，很多的我们中国的大陆的背景的这些，呃，都是能够呃，差不多的这样的一种思想，这种背景吧。呃，也是，还有一点呃，一点我可能呃，比较啊、呃、相信的就是。呃，有一句格言啊，就说，啊，叫“自胜者强”。嗯，我一直是觉得，啊、呃，要，要、啊、成为一个强者，生活的强者，我必须得靠我自己的力量来，啊，战胜我自己的这种，呃、啊，各种各样的，就是不好的这种习惯啊，这种欲望啊。嗯，我要，我要成为一个强者啊，就生活的强者，然后我就觉得我要需要去努力去战胜我自己。嗯，但这个这个愿望呢，就是这个呃一个一个我秉持的一个一个呃理念，就是当他啊、呃、在我啊、呃、碰到呃电脑游戏的时候，我就他就啊、呃、完全的是另外一个样子了。我在大概是二零零六年的时候啊、呃、就开始。呃，攒第一台自己的电脑，花了很多钱，呃，然后开始，呃，主要就是开始玩游戏了，啊、呃，电脑游戏，呃，而且一直是，呃，沉迷在里边，嗯、呃，非常的非常的严重，就是说，只要有时间，我基本上就在玩，嗯、呃，非常的严重，嗯、呃，就是严重到就是说，呃。我当时，我我我太太呃生生孩子坐月子的时候，呃，我还在彻夜的在玩游戏，呃，就是我呃有一就是有一次就是玩的非常非常严重，说他是那我一生中呃都是离死亡最近的一次，我的经历就是在非常的。非常严重，那就是说我我已经，我太太当时在带带着孩子在娘家，然后我就自己在，呃，放放放空了，就在拼命的玩玩，连着玩了好几夜，然后就说，呃，终于到一天晚上，我玩到早凌晨三点的时候，我说我得休息了，我就想去躺在床上去睡觉，但是我怎么也躺不下了，那会就说已经。就是心里开始啊、呃，心里发慌，然后就说怎么也怎么也睡不了，就是然后闻到自己能闻到那个那个喉咙里边有血腥的味道
我当时真的吓坏了，我就觉得这回肯定是完了，要死了。哎呀，这真真挣扎着爬爬起来不行，我就说，在街上打了个的，我就赶快跑到医院去了。就这么严重的情况下，我依然，啊、呃，并没有使我能够，呃，就从此就不玩游戏了，依然是非常呃严重的一个，呃，沉迷在游戏里面。即使我们后来到了加拿大来，呃，一直到延续了十几年的时间，我基本上都是有时间就在玩，而且。啊，让我自己都非常的觉得自己很失败，就是说没有办法控制我自己。我后来就真的就就投降了，我就说完了，这肯定就不行了。嗯，但这时候呢，我太太信主了，啊，她都，呃、啊，但她信主之后呢，呃、啊，她的一些呃、啊，我们的一些朋友啊，就是教会的朋友啊，就开始。啊，也跟我讲很多的他们的见证啊，想让给我讲一些圣经上的道理，但我依然依然啊不能够相信，我就觉得，呃，要我去信一个神，那我一定得很严肃的对待我的信仰，就是一定是得，呃，就说那么我要亲眼看到，亲身的知道，那才行，就说没有说谁谁。我不会通过这种功利的方法去信信神的，就说你一定得要，呃，让我让我知道这个是真的是神，我才能够去相信他。嗯，但这个这个理论呢，当时后来在二零一八年的夏令会上被远志明牧师的一篇讲道给啊打破了。他当时就说，啊、呃，一个很简单的一个道理，他说神。他在分析神是不可能为人所被创造的人所完全认识。他说人人是被神创造的，那么如果是创呃这个这个被创造者啊，如果是个创呃这个这个嗯这个就像一个电脑啊，我一个人在操作电脑，然后他在键盘上敲了个，如果电脑屏幕上出了一句话，你为什么敲 V 啊？啊，就就说那个电脑可能出问题了，你肯定要是坏了。嗯，就是说我们人是对神这个创造者，啊、嗯，是我们是永远不可能完全认识。这一点就是让我解决了这个一个最基本的一个一个对神的认知的问题。我不能等，等我自己了解了神之后才相信，我必须得先信他。这个道理就解决了这个大问题之后呢，就说。而我碰到了，就是我在电脑这个问题上的这种绝境，我自己也也认为我靠我自己我无法来战胜，我就说，那么我来试一试，我靠神，我再试一试。这样，我在二零零八年的圣诞节，我就我就受洗了。嗯，受洗呢，就说，呃，很奇妙哦，在受洗之后，一直到现在，就是说，游戏。从来就不再会，嗯，不再是一个问题。我就没有一次被游戏曾在就在被他抓住过我，真的是一个呃很神奇的一个神迹吧。嗯，就说，而这只是这个摆脱电脑的这个这个捆绑，只是一个很小的一件事情。从我现在来看，我信主大概有十年了，呃，十年十多年了，嗯、呃。一个很小的事情，其实其实更多的事情，我嗯很简单的，因为时间关系我就不说了。我经历了很多太多太多神的这种恩典和带领，嗯、呃，简单的说就说我们信了神之后，我是行在光明里，就是不再行在黑暗中了。嗯，我就呃时间关系，我简单总结一下吧，就说呃。一个是我觉得说，我们从来不是我们来找到神，是神找到了我们，是神找到了我们，不是不是我去发现了神，我自己通过我自己的努力去看到了神，不，你永远不会看到，你也会找到的。就是、说就像罗马书三章十节所描述的，就是、说没有一人，连一个也没有，没有明白，也没有寻求神的。都是偏离正路，一同变为无用，没有行善的，连一个也没有。就说我们都不是说，就说我们会想，就在做自己的
罪里边，因为我们我们行在世上的生活里边和和神里边的生活，这是两条并行的，嗯，一个平行的路，你有没有神的参与，没有神的带领，没有神的拯救，我们是不会交叉的，就是一定是要靠着神的带领。那么就说啊、呃，最后啊、呃，给大家给朋友们一句话，就是说，嗯、呃。我想就是，人的终点是上帝的开始。呃，回头看我在信主的过程，靠着他带领和拯救，才能够认识他。呃，我只是希望，呃，我没有信主的朋友们在在有感动的时候，啊，不要拒绝，不要犹豫，那是神伸出来的手。你要伸出手来抓住他，来回应他，然后你就可以得到神所应许的恩典和拯救。那可以可以肯定的说，神是信实的，啊、呃，他的爱是不离不弃，他爱我们就爱我们到底。好，谢谢大家。Thank you very much, David.、Uh... I'm I'm so happy that he could share his testimony. We we met David and his wife we about 15 years ago in Montreal, and we were so pleased when we came out to Victoria that、uh, they were here as well. So、uh, it's been a renewed friendship, even though now they've they've moved a bit out of Victoria, but we hope to see them again soon.、Uh, so we have、uh, one more miracle, and、uh, this is a very very special one. Uh, and it, it is the fulfillment of again a prophecy in the Old Testament,、uh, which I just want to read to you. It was from Ezekiel, and Ezekiel gave us this prophecy. He said,、uh, and it was predicting about Jesus coming. I myself will search for my sheep and will look after them. And there was this prediction that there would be many, many lost sheep, and that Jesus was coming. To locate the lost sheep, and we're all lost sheep until we're found. And、uh, I hope that maybe today, if you're still a lost sheep, that you will be found. We're going to meet a man who was a lost sheep, but Jesus is going to find him. And、uh, Jesus had arrived in a, an important city, was the city of Jericho, and he had an appointment. He wanted to meet somebody in this city. Now, of course, maybe it was the mayor. No, it wasn't the mayor. Would it be the bishop? No, it wasn't the bishop. It was one of these lost sheep, and、uh, this was a kind of unusual lost sheep. He was very short. He had a very funny name, and he was very, very rich, but very unpopular. So we want to read about him and find out、uh, just why Jesus was in that city and what he was doing there. So Luke chapter nineteen and verse one. Thanks, Martin. Good. Okay, there we are. So verse one, Jesus entered Jericho, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Was passing through. A, man a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Do you want me to say it again? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, "Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today." So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this. And they began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. All right. So an amazing story. And I want Martin to show you a picture. We have a good picture of this Zacchaeus. Uh, you're, <laughs> I, I think this is really, I mean, you have to say that sometimes the Bible is a little bit comical. You know, here you have this very rich man, a businessman in the city, a tax collector, and he's climbed up a tree in his rather grand clothes so that he can look and find Jesus. And of course, Jesus doesn't pass him by, Jesus stops. But I think it's a, a priceless story. And you see, this was one of those lost sheep. But, and Jesus found him in a tree. Now, you don't usually go for looking for people in trees, but anyway, there he was. Now, what was this man's profession? Why was he so rich? Well, this man was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors, were considered to be traitors. You see, they were collecting tax and they usually took more tax than they should. And then they were giving it to the Roman government, but not before they took a little for themselves as well. That's why he was so rich. But you see, he was working for the corrupt Roman government. And, uh, and um, he was taking the people's money and giving it to their enemy. And the, the Romans were using that money to oppress the people. So he was not at all popular. And that's why he was so rich. He was actually stealing from his own people. Uh, so this is, this is the story of Zacchaeus. Now the people were utterly shocked when Jesus stood at the bottom of that tree. And this is what Jesus said, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Well, the people couldn't believe this. What were they muttering under their breath? They said, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Well, I'm kind of interested in this. They thought Zacchaeus was a sinner, but obviously from what they were saying, they didn't see themselves as sinners. So that was a mistake on their part. Well, they weren't very pleased with Jesus going to visit Zacchaeus, but Jesus saw that Zacchaeus had a need and Jesus was going to help Zacchaeus. Now, Jesus didn't say, Zacchaeus, I want to have a little visit with you today. No, I like what Jesus said. He said, Zacchaeus, I have come to stay. Where, was, where is it now? Um, um, Yes, I must stay at your house today. Stay, that means like that sounds kind of permanent. And that's exactly what Jesus had in mind. He wanted to be permanently with Zacchaeus. He wanted to change Zacchaeus' life. So the only way he could do that was if he stayed with Zacchaeus. And I think Jesus is saying, saying the same thing to you and to me. He wants to stay with us. He doesn't just want to pop in for a little visit and then leave again. No, Jesus wants to stay. Are you ready to invite Jesus to stay with you? Would you like Jesus to come and stay with you? Uh, let's turn to page um, 13. Because here we have a very, very special miracle. Let's put it up here. And this miracle was Jesus had power and authority over man's character. All right, our character. 
Well, yes, of course. Look at Zacchaeus. He was so greedy. He was taking money from everybody that he could. But then suddenly after he repented and became a follower of Jesus, he became generous. And did you see the change? He was going to give half of his possessions to the poor. And if he had taken anything from someone that he shouldn't have, he was going to give them four times that amount back again. He was a changed man. We can see it from his actions. Jesus did a miracle in his heart. He changed his character. And I want to read to you, or I want you to read it with me actually, from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, because these are the character traits that God wants to bring into your life, into my life. Let's read it together and you think about whether you would like some of this fruit in your life. It's called the fruit of the spirit. You see, when this Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts, then the Holy Spirit begins to change us. And this is how the Bible describes that change. These are the fruits that he wants to bring into our lives. Let's read it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace patience, patience, kindness, kindness goodness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness gentleness, gentleness, and self-control. Self As you look at that list, do you need any of those fruits in your life? Do you need more love? How about more joy? What about more peace? How about some more patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? A few years ago, one of the students came up to me at the end of this class, and he said, I want to pray to receive Jesus into my life today. I said, that's, that's great. He said, you know what? I need some of those fruits in my life. He said, I am so impatient with my children. I want more patience and more self-control. Maybe some of you parents can relate to that. Well, we prayed together. And a few weeks later, I asked him, how are things going? He said, God is already changing me. He was becoming more patient. He was having more self-control. You know, these are the fruits of the spirit. This is what God wants to do in our lives. It doesn't happen all suddenly just overnight. No, it's a gradual process. But God wants to change our character. He wants to make us to be like Jesus. Can you believe that? That's what the Bible tells us. So maybe some of you are in need of a character change. Maybe you would like some of those fruits in your life. All right, now we're going to, we've, so we've come to the end of our uh, lesson. I just want to briefly give a conclusion here. So the king has arrived and his kingdom has come. Jesus has arrived. He is the king. He is the king of God's kingdom. And so it's up to us. Do we want to become part of this kingdom? Do we want to live under the kingship of Jesus? I hope so. So in the um, breakout, we're going to talk about who is this Jesus? Have you come to any conclusions? Why did Jesus do all these miracles? Think about those. We're going to talk about that in our group. And I just want to say that this, these are not the only miracles that Jesus did. In fact, John writes, and I'll just read it to you. Jesus did many other miracle, miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there are many, many more miracles. There are many more that you can read about in the Gospels, and even there are many more that were never recorded. Jesus is a miracle working God. Now, I was very much struck with the phrase, 
that Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I must stay in your house today. And I want to challenge all of us. Are you ready to invite Jesus to come and stay in your life, in your house? You see, otherwise we're leaving him outside of our lives and don't leave him outside. He's come to save us from our sins. Invite him in, why not? Let's turn to page 14. And this was his mission. This was the mission of Jesus. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. We are all lost sheep until we've been found. And Jesus is searching for the lost sheep and he's calling us, come, come, follow me. And you don't need to be lost anymore. You can come and join God's big family and be part of God's kingdom. Remember Jesus' announcement. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. We need to repent. We need to say we're sorry for the sins that we've done. And then invite Jesus to come into our hearts and he will forgive us. We can be transformed. And in um, 2 Corinthians, there's a verse that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. You will be a new creation. Invite Jesus into your heart. Why not? All right, we have a prayer and you can pray it with me. And uh, then I just will give a very brief prayer and then we'll uh, hear about what next week is going to be and then we'll have another breakout. So join me in the prayer. My God in heaven, like Zacchaeus, I've been lost for a long time. I need to be changed. I want to repent of my sin and receive you into my life to become a child of God. Thank you for dying for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me just pray briefly. Our Father, today we've been thinking about sin, and I was very glad to see the Chinese description of sin in that very interesting character of the snare and then the wide-winged bird getting caught in the snare, that that's a picture of our lives. We are that bird and we're caught in the snare of sin. It holds us in bondage. It's like a prison. But Lord, you have come to release us from the sin, to break us out of that imprisonment and to give us freedom. Lord, for any of us that have not yet believed, I do pray, Lord God, that today will be the day when they will be released from that prison of sin and that they will know that they are on the road to be transformed into a new character through your power working in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful gift that you have for each one of us. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we have maybe the most important class, although each class I find is very, very important, but we're going to do the teachings of Jesus. And so uh, there's the, the, the references there. I'll send them to you during the week, but you may want to start reading them now. And in fact, if you can read through the book of Matthew and the book of John, uh, do try and take the time to do that. If you only have time for one, then I would suggest read through the book of John and you will, it's all about Jesus teaching. So very, very important. And we will have another one of our uh, friends uh, share her testimony next week. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, hearing David and we'll have some more towards the end of the class. So we have our next breakout and uh, you can join your leader in, in your group.